Welcome to the Analytics Engineering Podcast, featuring conversations with practitioners inventing the future of analytics engineering. On this episode, we sit down with two industry legends, Mike Stonebreaker and Andy Palmer. It's hard to give these two a proper introduction because they're just so prolific. Dr. Stonebreaker is credited as the creator of Postgres, one of the most popular databases in existence today. He also taught at both Berkeley and MIT and was the recipient of the Turing Award, the greatest honor you can receive in computing. Andy Palmer is a force in his own right, and the two of them have started a handful of companies together, the latest of which is Tamer, where Andy is the CEO. Andy is also a prolific investor through his seed fund, Coalabs, where he's backed over 100 entrepreneurs. The two of them have incredible chemistry and banter, and this episode is a fun one because we get a trip down database memory lane with lots of unfiltered takes on all the technologies that they've worked on. I'm laughing as you say this because banter is a is an interesting word for what went on in this episode. I would say shit talking also. I think that's <laughs> I think it's fair to say. No, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. I hope that the audience will bear with me at the beginning because, you know, honestly. I was a little starstruck. These are folks that I've been reading about in textbooks for a long time. And so to have the opportunity to hang out and get to chat was really, really special. Yeah, I was in a similar spot as you, Tristan. I was just really in awe that we got to speak to two people that have just seen so much over the years and have really made a dent in the data and technology world. So very exciting episode. And without further ado, let's get into it. Andy Palmer, Michael Stonebreaker, welcome to the podcast. Excited to have you. Thanks, Tristan. Great to see you. I'll leave it to the two of you. If you want to do quick intros, I think a lot of folks are going to recognize your work, but uh, great to get some quick backgrounds. Mike, do you mind if I go first? I'm always uh, hesitant to follow a Turing Award winner. <laughs> <laughs> By all means. Thank you. Age before beauty. <laughs> My name is Ian Palmer. I'm an old AI guy from the 1980s. I started studying AI with uh, Marvin Minsky um, and then uh, found my way into enterprise systems of all sorts and um, have been building uh, startups and uh, products uh, for the enterprise and um, also been a, a chief data officer and a chief information officer uh, in the biopharmaceutical industry. And uh, most recently, uh, Mike and I started a, a company called Tamer together, where I'm the CEO and co-founder. That's me. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Stonebreaker. Uh, I'm on the faculty at MIT. Oh, I've been a professor forever. And a million years ago, I built Ingress. And a half a million years ago, I built Postgres. And a while ago, Andy and I uh, built Vertica. And so I do database stuff. And one of my interests has been on um, data integration. And that was the reason for Tamer. But I guess my main claim to fame, besides winning the Turing Award. <laughs> That's a first on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then my wife and I rode a tandem bicycle across the United States uh, a few oh, years ago, cool. and we're still married. That's incredible. How long does it take to ride a tandem bike bicycle across the states? Took us nine weeks. Wow. My husband's a big biker, and he always says people who bike together stay together. So I'm going to tell him this story. <laughs> you should talk to Beth first. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason my wife was willing to go was we were welded together. <laughs> nice. Given the kind of historical span that we are going to navigate over the next hour, it's fair to say that maybe both of you could have decided that you had sufficient wins in the history books to have hung up your skis long since. And yet here you are doing our little podcast. So I, I'm asking this question because my guess is that there's something that keeps you both coming back to this space. And it's got to be something like fun or curiosity or something like that. So I'm, I'm just curious, what keeps you attacking this stuff that we're all attacking today? After you, Mike. Over Thanksgiving, my, my wife and I got to visit our grandkids and my mother-in-law in Florida. So we spent a couple days in Sarasota, sort of being tourists. And for a couple of days, I was really ready to do something real. 
And so I guess the answer is I, I can't imagine sitting on the beach or playing golf. So the answer is I really like what I do and I'm going to continue to do it as long as I'm viable. And for me, my partnership with Mike is a, is a great example. I'm, I'm in awe of everything that Mike has accomplished and continues to accomplish. You know, the number of ideas in Mike's head are remarkable, uh, including his latest idea, which is for a new operating system built on top of a uh, uh, database. Mm. But the thing that's amazing about data is that, you know, is, you know, Mike and I have been doing it for most of our careers, 30, 40 plus years, but it's becoming more and more important and more recognized now than ever. And so I think part of what keeps me, you know, sort of engaged is a lot of the things that, you know, we've known for, for decades. Marvin Minsky taught me two things. One was it's always about the human and the machine working together. And the other is that it's uh, no algorithm is useful without enough great data. And so now that the world is sort of appreciating what we're doing, it feels good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and we, we, I think we can, we can be helpful. And so we like, we like being helpful and useful. Yeah. Do you ever get grumpy about people who in some circles, I've been doing this for a long time. I graduated in 2003. So I'm a bit after you both, but oftentimes I feel like the person who's been there, done that. But my guess is that when you talk about, you need a lot of great data, great data has meant something very different in, in different decades. And so I'm sure it's funny to talk to folks who like have grown up in an era of S3. One of the things that really frustrated us was HDFS. Um, hmm. We both thought Hadoop was a huge waste of time. Huh. Mike, you want to? But we're going to get there. I, oh. I, it's, <laughs> okay. it's funny because I watched a lot of recordings in preparation for this episode. And Mike has some extremely hot takes on Hadoop, which are, are kind of fun. Let's start a little bit before that. So the two of you have been working together for a long time. You've started five companies. When I was researching, I could only count three, but there are five, which is just insane. Vertica, VoltDB, Gobi, Paradigm 4, and most recently, Tamer. So it's very exciting. And Andy, we're going to get to your involvement in this relationship in a minute, but I do want to take it back to Mike. You described it a million years ago, but it was really early 1970s when you started working on one of the first relational databases, and it was called Ingress. And this is before the time of Oracle, and there's only a couple of universities doing some research on relational databases, uh, IBM research as well. Tell us like a little bit about what was Ingress, why was it really exciting, and did you have a sense that you were on to something big at the time? A bit of context. So I got a PhD from the University of Michigan in 1971. One, I got hired by Berkeley as an assistant professor. And the, the ground rules for being an assistant professor is you're given five years to prove that you're a big shit and they, <laughs> they either fire you or give you a lifetime appointment. And so all assistant professors I know of, including me, are on a treadmill to do something great. And so that was right after the time that Ted Cobb wrote his pioneering paper in CACM that said, uh, basically posed a relational database system. So we, we read everything that Ted Cobb had written and the, uh, competition was a thing called the Codasil report. And I could not understand it. It was this complicated, uh, network mess. And so uh, my colleague, Gene Wong, and I said, well, the obvious thing to do is to build a relational database system and prove out Ted Cobb's ideas. Now, neither of us had any experience building big software projects or database systems. And so you, you just start doing it. And so we just started building Ingress. And I think the huge goal was to get tenure. Uh, and that was the <laughs> over, that was the overwhelming need here. And I guess the other thing that happened was that as you, as you mentioned, there were other groups that had the same idea. And so, uh, a lot of people, uh, put in the first 90% of the effort to get something that they could run. For God knows what reason, uh, Gene Wong and I, put in the other 90% of the effort to get something that actually worked. And so Ingress was the only publicly distributed relational database system in the mid seventies. And it was at the right point at the right time. So we were just very, very lucky. 
there wasn't any big design. And you got your it. tenure? And I got tenure. <laughs> what was the license? Was it commercial? Well, uh, no, it was open source. Were there still the same licenses back then? Was this like MIT license or something? Well, um, it was open source and it's widely, among the aficionado, it's widely considered the first real open source project. Huh. And we had, you know, this, this was not by any design. It was, you know, naive, you know, like people would ask us for the software and you couldn't, back then you couldn't really send them the object code because they would have to recompile it and whatever mm-hmm. to make it run at all. We would just send out tapes and it never occurred to us that to do anything else. And then of course, uh, what happened next was Larry Ellison took the specifications of one of the other projects, the IBM system R, and he produced a, a relational database system of 1979. By then, Ingress had been publicly distributed for three years and worked very well. And here was Larry Ellison claiming that uh, Oracle uh, was 10 times faster than Ingress when Oracle didn't run at all. And <laughs> we, we had real people using the system. And so that got my hackles up. And uh, that one of the reasons to start a commercial company to, to commercialize um, Ingress. The other reason was Arizona State University was, you know, that one of their programmers came to a course that we gave on relational databases and he said, God, this is great stuff. And he wanted to put the student record system on an Ingress database. This was in 1978. And so uh, what happened was he could get by the fact that you had to get an unsupported operating system, namely Unix from AT&T in North Carolina. He could get by that you had to get an unsupported database system from these kooks at Berkeley. But the project went down the drain when he realized that there was no COBOL available for Unix and Arizona State was a COBOL shop. So the combination of unsupported operating system, unsupported database system, and no COBOL basically doomed Ingress to, you know, being an academic curiosity. And so to make a difference, as well as to go fight Larry Ellison, it was, we had to start a company and support the software and move it on an operating system that people at the time were actually using. So that's kind of how Ingress got started. The commercial Ingress got started. And so then after Ingress, you had another even bigger hit, Postgres, which I actually never realized that the name Postgres came from Ingress. I just kind of took it for granted as something that we all use today. It's a top five most used database currently. And one of the things I learned in researching was that you actually first wrote it in Lisp before you moved it to C. So maybe you learned your lesson a little bit (laughs) after Ingress on developing Postgres. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the early day stories or what are some of the things that few people know about Postgres and when it was getting started? Well, what actually happened was uh, by 1982, commercial Ingress was wildly better than academic Ingress. And they had, you know, 20 programmers developing it. And it was pretty obvious that there was no possible way that the academic uh, project could compete. So we had to do something else. And that was about the same time. Ingress actually stood for something besides French painter. It stood for the interactive graphics and retrieval system. And graphics was in the name because one of my colleagues down the hall was interested in building a GIS system on top of Ingress. And we tried to do that and and it failed miserably. And it failed miserably because one of the things you want to do is point at Polygon and writing point in Polygon in SQL is really, really hard and really, really slow. 
So it was pretty clear that once you got outside business data processing, that people wanted, you know, geographic types, people wanted medical, various kinds of types. And this was all sort of brought home to me when one of the early commercial customers of Ingress called me up one day. And this was right after Ingress had put in uh, date and time as a data type on um, request all kinds of people. It's a good one. It's one of my favorite data types. And he said, you did date and time wrong. And I said, huh? We implemented it the way ANSI had in mind. You know, what do you mean we did it wrong? And so after a conversation, it turned out that he was a, he was in charge of a bond application uh, on Wall Street. And for whatever reason, in his world, the same amount of interest on his kind of bond during each month, regardless of how long the month was. So when he subtracted March 15th minus February 15th, that's one month, not 28 days. You're costing him money. <laughs> April 15th minus March 15th, that's one month, that's... He was running on a calendar that had uh, equal length months each of 30 days. And so he needed to subtract the time you sold the bond. Well, he did to the time he bought the bond from the time he sold it. And he wanted to just do that subtraction in the database, but it got the wrong answer. It got Julian calendar time, not his kind of bond time. So he said, why can't I overload subtraction with the way I want it to look? And of course, you couldn't do that with Ingress. It wasn't built to have a flexible type system. And so that got us to prototype the type system that's in Postgres. And the fact that we had to do something different than Ingress, that was the reason to start building Postgres. So we threw the public domain version where it's, you know, rolled the cliff and started working on Postgres. And then we we just built, we'd spent years building Ingress and C. And the last thing anybody wanted to do was build another database system in C. So C++ wasn't ready. You couldn't imagine building a database system in COBOL. And so there weren't any reasonable option. And this was... In the early 80s, right when the Japanese fifth generation project was getting going and saying, you should write it, write everything in Lisp. So we said, why not? We'll try it. And of course, the problem is Lisp was the slowest thing on the planet. So we got a very early version of Postgres to do something. And response times were two orders of magnitude longer than they had to be. So we threw Lisp over the cliff and transliterated this code back to C and, and Postgres became a C project, but we would have loved to have done it in C++, but we were just a little too early. So we have date time because of a bond trader. <laughs> That's pretty much true. <laughs> well, and the professor down the hall who wanted geographic types. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. And Andy, we're going to bring you into the scene now. We're going to flash forward a little bit of time. So the two of you met or started working together in 2004. How did the two of you meet or how did you get connected? Mike and I were at a venture capital boondoggle down in, I think it was West Virginia. Is that right, Mike? Uh, at the Greenbrier and White yeah. Sulphur Springs, West oh, Virginia. Oh, it's amazing. There's a nuclear silo down there or something like that. Yeah. You can tour it. Yeah. Okay. So this was all expenses paid, boondoggles, compliments of, of a particular VC. And uh, Mike and I knew of each other really well. Of course, I was a huge fan of Postgres and user-defined functions for me were like life-changing in Postgres. But the, the real story is that before Mike and I actually spent any time together that weekend, our wives actually met Beth and Amy and um, they got along really well. And they came back to each of us independently and said, hey, you make us go to all these work functions all the time. And so we meet a lot of people that are not as interesting, but we like each other. And so you guys have to work together. So, so, 
our wives decided that we were going to work together uh, long before Mike and I. And then, of course, Mike and I met, and um, I at the time was working on some big data stuff in uh, the life sciences where I'd been really wrestling with very, very large databases, multi terabyte systems that were trying to get to run on Oracle Rack and failing. And I, you know, I kept trying to find who was actually making Oracle Rack work and found over and over again that it really wasn't working for anybody. And uh, Mike had written uh, in the team uh, at, uh, that was working on C-Store, the academic project, had uh, designed what would become Vertica eventually. And uh, I fell in love with the idea because I had the problem that, you know, um, Oracle was not made to do the kind of read-oriented workloads that people were trying to make it do. So tell us a little bit more about that. So Postgres, really fantastic transactional database. It was row-based and Vertica was one of the first databases that kind of flipped that on its head and was more columnar in nature. Why is that such an important switch in how you think about databases and tell us what Vertica solved in the market? Mike really educated me, but you know, the amazing thing about column-oriented databases, is the first one was actually a good one was written back in the 60s, I think. Isn't that right, Mike? Sybase IQ was probably arguably the first, the, one. the first commercial one. And that was, that was in the early 80s. We did not invent all of their databases. Yeah. But Mike recognized, right? Mike and his, his academic colleagues wrote a great paper called One Size Does Not Fit All in Database Systems. And it was clear to me after, you know, reading the draft in that paper that a lot of us, had been using row-oriented databases, which were really designed to optimize for writes, you know, as data was coming into the, the, the database. We were trying to use it to do reads, and Oracle didn't really want to rewrite their whole system to change their storage method. And so they, they invented Larry Ellison and Mike's and my good friend Jerry Held, who is Mike's very first postdoc at Berkeley. They invented this thing called materialized views in Oracle, which kind of enabled Oracle to do read-oriented stuff, but didn't really make it very cost efficient to do so. And so by the time the early 2000s rolled around, like people were using Oracle and DB2 and SQL Server to do all these unnatural acts of large-scale read-oriented workloads. And Mike really inspired a whole generation of people to recognize that you should be using built for purpose data systems. And Vertica for us was the first one of those. And then we did a spin out from Vertica that was called VoltDB. That was that OLTP system. You know, Mike, what am I missing? Well, I think what, at least for me, the data warehouse market really began in the mid 1990s. And it was retail guys like Sears and Walmart began putting transactional sales data into a repository and these repositories paid for themselves within six months with better buying decisions, better stock rotation. So the warehouse market was sort of catapulted into existence by the retail guys and everybody owed suit because historical customer facing data, you know, has a lot of value. And so it shocked me when I realized that the average data warehouse, well, well, I would say the best way to design data warehouses is to have a fact table in the middle and some dimensionals surrounding it. And fact tables are 50 or 100 bytes wide. And the average data warehouse query fetches three or four of 50 to 100 fields. And so if you organize your world as a row store where well, you read all the rest of the data, because it's in line, you're basically in line. If you want to go fast, you've got to read all the four columns you need and not all the rest of them. So you've got to have a column store. You know, and so it's a column store is an order of magnitude faster than a row store on uh, data warehouse style data. And so that was the market Vertica went after with, you know, and I think they had a just a fabulous product and they were led by a world-class entrepreneur. <laughs> One of the things that was the most fun, and, and Mike and I were really lucky to work with the likes of Shopa Lawande, who ran engineering, and Chuck Bear, who was our, our lead architect, and Colin Mahoney, uh, who ran Vertica for most of its, its life. But one of the most satisfying things was to come in. We go into a, a, a big Oracle customer. They had a huge HP Superdome 
running Oracle with all these materialized views and all it was like multi-million dollar instance. And we'd rolled in, we had these little three node clusters that we rolled in because Mike and I believed in share, shared nothing kind of hardware and, um, and, and very cheap commodity hardware. And so we'd roll this little cluster in and we'd load the same data onto the little cluster that they had on this big, massive, you know, uh, configuration. And their, the, the queries on their big Oracle was taking like 24 hours. We would run the same queries like some second. And like, it was disbelief. Like they couldn't, but they're like, how is it possible What's the catch? that this yeah. little thing over here can run things faster than this big ass thing over here? We're like, well, you've just been sold a bad bill of goods by Larry Ellison for the last 30 <laughs> years. Like, you know, if you represent the data in the way it's going to be queried, all you need is this little cluster of, of you know, $3,000, you know, dollar computers, right? Um, and so it was really fun. I get the sense that you both have, uh, you're really united behind, you know, having a, a common enemy over the course of multiple decades. It's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very unifying. Here's my question. If you look at kind of the database market from the perspective of somebody like me or you know, other, other folks in the DBT analytics engineering community, it has felt like there's been a lot more maturity in the row store market for a long time. So like for my entire career, there's been very easy to access row store databases that are of high quality. So there's, there's never been like a lack of that. But in the Vertigo is obviously amazing, but I didn't have access to that because it was sold in a particular way to a particular type of companies. It wasn't, at least until in the past decade, it wasn't in the cloud. So the first time I and many folks like me had access to a column-oriented database. It was with Redshift in late 2012, early 2013. And so it created this perception that the column store database was actually like, quote unquote, harder to build. It took longer for many of us to get our hands on this. But my guess is that that's not actually what was going on. Mike, what you were saying before is that the real like commercial use case only arose for the data warehouse in the 90s with cataloging and customer analytics. So is it just that the commercial use case came a little bit later? Well, there, there, there are open source data warehouse engines. Presto is one of them. Greenplum is another. And I think what really happened was row stores were commercialized in, in the early 80s. And 20 years later, there were some nice open source versions. And I think the warehouse market didn't exist until the mid nineties. And so 20 years later, um, there started to be some re reasonable open source systems. So I think the answer is it takes a while to get a new technology bulletproof fast and ultra reliable. There's a sort of a thread here, which is businesses and, and like even consumers. Like we spent most of the 80s and 90s, like automating business processes. Row stores are good enough for, for those mm -hmm. kind of design for those kinds of things, right? And then you had, to, you, there was a certain amount of time where data sort of had to accumulate, right? And once it started accumulating and being produced, then people were like, well, wait a minute, I need a better way to query this. And so it was natural for column stores to kind of evolve when they did. And one of the other companies that emerged when Vertica it was evolving was NetTeza, which was an appliance company, basically. They used Postgres essentially and, and had a, a proprietary ASIC that, that made, it, made it run really fast on this proprietary hardware. And neither Mike or I like proprietary hardware at all. We think it's a bad thing. And, but when we were first building Vertica, there was also a, a team at, at Google that was writing Bigtable and um, very similar ideas, very simple principles. A couple of years after we had gotten started, um, and Google was going, uh, the, there was a team at SAP that started building HANA. Um, mm -hmm. and so this, this design pattern that Mike kind of like lifted to the, to the forefront with the C store paper, um, a lot of people started picking up on it and it just, it was like one of these things that just made sense. And there's only so many design patterns in computer science. And so, um, it was sort of a logical thing for column stores to evolve. Hey, and emerge when they did. I think both Mike and I regret not open sourcing Vertica. It was a great huh. system and should have been available to more people. Yeah. So it feels like early 2000s, there was a lot of innovation happening in data architectures. I should say the two of you are very much relational people. But interestingly, I think now's our time to get into Hadoop because a year after you launched Vertica, that was when Hadoop was first released. And there's some connections actually between this team 
here and the founders of Cloudera. So I'd love to hear a little bit about some of your opinions about the NoSQL movement, the rise of Hadoop, the eventual fall, and what are the maybe connections that you had to the project? Be nice to Michael Olson, Mike. Don't, don't throw him <laughs> under the bus. Well, let, let's, let's start in 2004 when uh, Google wrote MapReduce. At the time, everybody assumed that Google was, knew what they were doing, which in many fields they do, but in databases, they, they were just naive babes in the woods. And so Yahoo basically wrote the dupe, which is a clone of MapReduce, perfect clone. And so the problem with MapReduce, that it is good for anything. And Google discarded MapReduce in 2011, I think. Well, MapReduce was, was purpose built to support Google's crawl of the internet. And on the application for which MapReduce was purpose built, Google decided to abandon it uh, in 2011, basically because MapReduce was a batch system and Google by this point needed their crawl to be interactive. And so they moved their crawl over to Bigtable. Before you go forwards in time, is your assertion that even back in 2004, there were superior design patterns that ideally they would have used? Oh, absolutely. So, mm. so what happened was MapReduce got all this PR from, from Google must know what they're doing. So this must be a good idea. In 2009, we wrote a paper that benchmarked MapReduce, well, benchmarked the open source version, Hadoop, against parallel warehouse database systems. And warehouse database systems totally killed Hadoop, you know, like an order of magnitude faster. And so on decision support queries, MapReduce is no good at all for all kinds of technical reasons. And that was widely known in 2009. And, you know, CACM invited dueling papers on MapReduce and on uh, basically parallel decisions for databases. And those papers appeared in, in 2010 or 11. I can't remember exactly when. The Google guys were arguing that MapReduce worked well if you were very careful to tune it and you were very careful to the problems that you tried to address with it and that it had redeeming social value and the criticism from the parallel database guys was withering. This crap is no good. It's not flexible enough. Nobody wants it. So it turns out two things happened that pretty much rendered this whole discussion moot. First was Google abandoned MapReduce in 2012. So the main proponent of MapReduce said, you know, this is not what we want anymore. And the second thing was all kinds of enterprises had been sort of sold a basket of goods saying MapReduce is a great thing. You should buy a cluster, put Linux on it, put Hadoop slash MapReduce it and your enterprise programmers, customers will love it. So lots of enterprises bought the farm and then found out that nobody wanted MapReduce. Nobody in the enterprise. It just wasn't flexible enough to do any interesting decisions or queries. So here was a system that nobody wanted, that Google had abandoned, but enterprises had spent large amounts of money building out clusters to do a MapReduce market that didn't exist. So now Cloudera and Hortonworks and others have a big problem. And just to make the connection for everyone listening, the CEO of Cloudera was who? And what's your relationship to him? Mike Olson. Mike Olson worked, worked for me on Postgres. So he was my student. So 
I think you have probably the longest list of successful students that I've ever seen. You've just had this army of people who have studied with you. Your PhD students have gone on to build a lot of really incredible companies. So all the shade that he's throwing towards Hadoop and MapReduce, somewhere along the way, Cloudera went public, was successful, ultimately got sold $5 billion by private equity. But Mike Olson is a, a former student of yours. Mike Olson is a marketing genius. Basically what happened was <laughs> here, here is this technology that nobody wants. And here's a company, Cloudera, whose purpose is to sell something nobody wants. And so Mike Olson promptly rebranded the do. <laughs> Hadoop Julie and I are trying something. to keep ourselves on mute so that we don't have to laugh too hard. <laughs> this is so, awesome. No, keep, please continue. <laughs> Hadoop started off meaning Hadoop, meaning MapReduce public domain on top of HDFS, which is public domain version of the Google file system. So it started out as a clone of Google's MapReduce on top of public domain version of the Google file system. So nobody wants that. So Mike Olson in sort of sheer genius said, well, we're going to change the definition of Hadoop. Doesn't mean what I just meant. It now means your application. Uh, it means the whole stack. So it means HDFS, maybe Hadoop, but then your application. And very quickly it turned into your application on top of HDFS map reduces nowhere in sight. And so that's basically what Cloudera and others were selling. Map reduce pretty much died in 2012 and Cloudera and Horton Voice kept the infrastructure alive by changing its definition. And it's now dying basically because HDFS is not all that good a file system and S3 and others are just are better. So they kept Mike Olson with marketing acumen, kept that market alive for many years after it should have died. Andy, when this story is playing out, are you at Vertica at that point? From the Vertica world, you kind of know you've got a better thing. And there's this really the buzz around Hadoop and MapReduce and everything was so gigantic in this time period. And it just has to be a really interesting experience to have the better technology, but roll up into an enterprise and have to combat this wave of enthusiasm. Yeah. And, you know, like we, we, the, the big mistake we made, you know, Mike, Mike is right. You know, Mike Olson is a marketing genius and, but that the open source nature of the product was really powerful dynamic. And, um, you know, there were a lot of people that were sick of being charged too much money from IBM and Oracle and Microsoft and everybody else. And so they were looking for something that was a bit of an open source thing. And when I'd say we should have open sourced Vertica, um, I really, like, if we had done that, I think that it would have become the, the default uh, for a lot of folks. And, um, you know, it was another system called Green Plums uh, that was kind of similar in some ways that um, arguably we were a lot better technically, but, um, you know, we sort of held on to this idea that if you've got great software, you should charge a lot of money for it. And um, I think we, you know, I think that caused us to fail, you know, um, relative to the overall uh, adoption of, of, of Hadoop. And the real shame in that whole thing is that there are a lot of people, uh, I know Colin Maloney feels this way um, when he was running Vertica, where, you know, we, you would get these people who bought Hadoop as if it was a database and then spent three or four years on it and millions of dollars and then realized it was never going to do what they wanted, kind of as Mike was describing. And then they were like, well, what do I do now? And along came Colin and Shilpa and, and team and provided a, a system that actually worked. And so, uh, and I think Vertica at one point actually enabled Vertica to run on HDFS, which, you know, made them all feel warm and fuzzy about the money they had paid for Cloudera. Um, but, you know, but gave them a real database, a query oriented database on top of it. And then, you know, the other thing that happened now is that now that like, Cloud, the cloud data platforms kind of came along just in time. AWS with Redshift, which was not so good at the beginning, but then got better after they built their compiled version. And then, you know, Bigtable, and, which became BigQuery, really. When Mike and I met with the Bigtable team back in 2004, you know, we were pretty committed at Vertica to having a system that had SQL on top of it and that was acid. 
you know, that was a tra- had transactional integrity, two classic things in database systems, right? And the big table team was like, yeah, we don't really care about, you know, transactional integrity. Eventually consistent is good enough. And we don't care about SQL because we have a lot of smart programmers at Google that can write their own queries. And uh, Mike and I were like, well, okay, but eventually you probably want transactional integrity and SQL. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, things caught up with them. And one of Mike's ex-students who was at, at Google, we had lunch with him one day and he was really depressed and we're like, what's wrong? He's like, I spent all of my time writing queries for these bozo business people that can't write queries. And we're like, well, we told you, like, if you didn't put SQL on top of it, you were going to have to write queries. It's like, I know, I know. So they, the evolution of these sh- database systems is, is in some ways, maybe for Mike and I, very predictable. And, you know, you say, well, we keep doing the same stuff for, for 30, 40 years. Um, one of the downsides of doing that is you watch people make the same mistakes over and mm-hmm. over and over again. And I think, I don't know, Mike, it'd be great to hear what you think, but we see the same kind of thing going on now with federated data systems. So data mm-hmm. mesh and data fabric are all the rage. And we've seen the, the industry sort of go back and forth between aggregated and federated over the last 50 years. And, you know, federated design patterns are good. Uh, and useful, but eventually you've got really challenging, you know, performance issues um, unless you have some global query optimizer, which nobody has really built yet. So I, I'm kind of skeptical that this next round of uh, federated query systems is going to deliver on all the promises. It's just kind of like, I mean, just waiting for it to kind of go the, maybe not go the way of Hadoop. <laughs> I would never want uh, the Starburst team to hear that, but he though, but it's, it's, it, it, I think it's, I think it's a bit overhyped right now. I don't know, Mike, what do you think about all this data mesh, data fabric stuff? Well, I think back to the previous question, Google now believes in transactions, believes in SQL. And so they got religion and they got religion when they hire some really good database people. And so I think the cloud guys. Mm-hmm you know, we're just very arrogant. They said, you know, well, we're, we're really smart. We can build a database system and we don't need any database experts. We can do it ourselves. And, and so they built stuff that, you know, was not what they needed and they eventually fixed it. So I think the answer is a certain amount of not invented here and arrogance on the part of the nature on cloud providers, you know, sort of slowed them down by a decade. And maybe the opposite is, is true of, of Snowflake, right? Like, as Mike and I are good friends with Thierry and Benoit Marcin that started Snowflake, and they are great database systems. They totally know what they're doing. That's where we want to go. So we're, we're running up on time, but this is a dangerous question for me to ask because we're close partners with all of these folks. And, we, and Julie and I are going to stay out of the answer to this question because we love everybody. But very interested in any takes from either of you on the database systems that are being built today have a lot of growth, a lot of traction. Let's start with the cloud. The cloud vendors pricing scheme makes it actually a requirement that you have software as a service so that uh, the way they charge, you don't want to have an idle image, an idle database image sitting there. And so you want to get rid of it if it has no work to do. So resource elasticity is really, really important. If you have at the, at the end of the month, if you need 50 processors, uh, you get 50. And then uh, on day three of the month, you only need three. You want to go down to three because of the way pricing system works. So the resource elasticity is a huge deal. And you can do that on the cloud. And Snowflake realized that at the very beginning, and they built a resource elastic engine. Everybody has had an on-prem engine where this is not, not an issue and moved it to the cloud where you, it wasn't resource elastic. And so Snowflake had a big advantage and they capitalized on it, you know, fabulously. But everybody has realized that, realized it's a few years ago. And Redshift has a resource elastic system, or we a resource elastic system. And Amazon has announced that all of their database systems are going to be resource elastic. Vertica is moved to the cloud. They have a resource elastic system. So I, the answer is everybody has that. And it's basically table stakes. And so I think uh, Snowflake has to you know, stay ahead. 
and we'll see how they do. All right. Closing thoughts. So resource elastic, being in the cloud is important. Now it's table stake. That's no longer your advantage. Andy, any final thoughts from you on modern database technologies? What are we seeing that's exciting? What's maybe overhyped? The closing thought is that, you know, Mike and I have been through so many different rounds of people moving their data around and putting it in lots of different places. And our real mission at, at Tamer is to help people make use of their data, get the data clean, curated, and continually updated so that they, lots of consumers can use it. And so we're kind of ready for people to stop moving their data around. We're kind of like, you move it to Snowflake, great. Now let's make the data high quality and very, very, very continuously updated. So that, you know, we have a vested interest in that. Just, just not, not only because it's what Tamer's interested in, but we just think it's time, right? Like yeah. data warehouses never met expectations. Data lakes were kind of a fail, but you know, these cloud data platforms in order to make them really worth the effort of moving your data in there, you have to make the data great. And uh, so that lots of people and other machines can use it. Lots of purpose-built databases now. They're generally pretty good, but the problems are still there and you have to move up the stack to solve them. Up the stack. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'll close for one statistic, which is data scientists. I've talked to a lot of them. I asked them the following question. What percentage of your time do you actually get to spend doing data science? And no one claims more than 20%. The other 80% is on data preparation, data integration, data cleaning, basically data mungy. And so data scientists spend the vast majority of their time doing something other than data science. And so we have to get wildly better at data preparation because it's pretty much unacceptable for a data scientists to spend four days a week on what they consider a grudge work. And so Tamer and others are, are trying hard to help out. And DBT, this, this is why we love you guys so much. Same mission. We agree on that one for sure. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast and for sharing all of your experiences. Certainly learned a lot along the way. Yeah, thank you both. This has been so much fun. This has been a lot of fun. You guys are great. Great to see you guys. Thank you. The Analytics Engineering Podcast is sponsored by DBT Labs and is hosted by Tristan Handy and myself, Julia Schottenstein. Have comments, questions, or guest suggestions? Email us at podcast at dbtlabs.com. Our producers are Jeff Fox and David Krevit. If you enjoy the show, please drop a review or share it with a friend. Thanks for listening.